Hey guys, it's time for module two. And so we're gonna go ahead and jump right in. Once again, I'm not gonna to go too in depth into the material. I'm just gonna cover the high points. We'll go through the slides together, generally to give you an idea of the things that are gonna be on the quiz. And then from there, you need to read the material, uh, read module two in the book. And from that point, then you should be prepared for the uh, quiz itself. Remember in class, we're just kind of go through and do the labs. We're going to try to get two labs done this week. So uh, especially these labs are pretty simple. So we're going to do what we can to get as much done as we can quickly. That way, toward the end of the year, if we have more complicated things and we need to spend extra time, then we can do that and maybe spend two lab periods on one lab if we have to. So having said that, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, here we are, and we're looking at the slides for Module 2. This is infrastructure and documentation. Infrastructure is how the network is put together. It's the hardware, it's the software, it's the uh, topology, as we learned last time. And then documentation is a physical, uh, graphical record of how the network is put together. Basically, it can be drawings, it can be CAD, it can be... Uh, Vimeo from Microsoft. There are a lot of different softwares out there that you can use to make network diagrams. Uh, we're going to look at some of the command line tools that will help you map your network. We're going to look at Nmap and a couple of other things that will actually uh, go out and ping the network for you and find all the different uh, nodes and computers and switches and whatnot that are on the network and that will help you build your network documentation and then hopefully we'll show you how to maintain that documentation. So having said that, here are the objectives for this module. As you have probably have already noticed, each module is set up so that the very first page are the module objectives. This is what you should learn going into the module. And the very last page is an overview. That is what you should have learned. Basically, they're the same page. So what I want you to do at the end of each module, look at the objectives and think back and say, well, did I cover those? If not, you need to let me know. You can say, Mr. White, we did not get these done. Uh, I didn't understand this part or this is something because the module objectives combine together to form the class objectives and the class objectives are what you need to know to pass certification tests or to uh, complete the final exam for the class, things like that. So three module objectives that we want to accomplish for module two. Describe the roles of various network and cabling equipment in commercial buildings and work areas. We're going to look at some construction standards and uh, we're going to look at the network cabling and how it goes into the building. We're also going to look at the various components that we connect to make up the network. We're talking routers, and switches, and uh, the different devices, firewalls, and things like that. Maintaining network documentation. There are three steps to that. You have to generate it. If it's not there already, you have to create it. Number two, you have to maintain it. And number three, then as things change, you have to change that. You have to edit the documentation. So basically what you have is a, a picture, uh, a graphical representation of your network. And as you change the network, managing changes made to a network. As you change the network, you add more pieces, then you need to uh, change the documentation. So those are the three things we want to get out of this module. <laughs> Structured cabling is basically a way of, of building the network infrastructure into the building as you're building the building. ANSI TIA-568 is the commercial building wiring standard, and this covers uh, low voltage wiring. Basically, you're looking at security camera wiring, computer network wiring, phone wiring, anything like that. Uh, this is low voltage, what they call low voltage. It's not power line, although that's also covered by a standard as well. Wiring standard describes the best way to install networking media and to, uh, by doing that, what you're doing is you're making maintenance and uh, modification a lot simpler. And it uh, doesn't matter whether it's media, whether it's security cameras, whether it's computers, whether it's phones. Uh, these are some things that you need to do when you're building the building and running the Cat5 cable. That will definitely affect how people who come in later to use the network, it's going to affect how uh, what a good or a bad time that they have. 
Structured cabling is based on a hierarchical, hierarchical design that assumes that the network is using a star uh, topology for its, the way it's laid out. And the reason that it does that is because each node on a star network has a direct line back to the router or back to the switch, well, back to the router because every single piece has one line that's designated to it, has one network cable that takes it back through a switch, through a patch panel, all the way back to the router. And that way uh, you don't have more than one point of failure. So uh, basically if, uh, if, let's say my network cable breaks for some reason or my network socket doesn't work, uh, everybody else's will still work, it's just me that's down. Whereas if you have daisy chains or things like that, then when one person is down, everybody from that person on is down. So essentially, uh, a star topology is a very easy type of network to maintain. Okay, this is an outline. Uh, this is a an outline or a diagram, rather, of the cabling of a building. And uh, a lot of this is going to be vocabulary. You need to understand the vocabulary that we're using here. And the first word we're going to look at is a DMARC. And that is the line of demarcation between the network uh, provider, internet provider's equipment and your equipment, whether it's company, home, school, whatever. In this case, you've got the ISP. This is the line coming in. It's probably fiber today. If this is a corporation, it certainly is. So to the ISP is going to be a fiber. It hits the demarcation appliance. Basically, the point of demarcation in this case is going to be an appliance that splits the fiber out to the different buildings. Because once you've got it, uh, a signal coming here to the demarcation in this uh, in this main data closet or main data room here, uh, what's going to happen is it's going to split into three backbones: one to this building, one to this building, and one to this building or well, it's still in the same building, but you get the idea. Each of these IDFs is a data room or a data closet. Sometimes people actually use real closets. That's not always a good idea because you don't usually get enough air conditioning in them, but still, it is what it is. Uh, the IDF is the data room where the backbone from the main uh, demarcation point comes in. And this, at this point, is where usually it will go from fiber coming in from the backbone to copper, which uh, spreads out to the workstations and the different nodes. So at this point, you'll generally have a some kind of uh, fiber to copper converter appliance, and then a switch, and all of these different computers will be connected then to that switch. And that will be the same in each one of the buildings. All the network uh, networked devices will be connected to a switch, which will have an interface that allows you to connect to copper. Generally, the switches will have an, in, uh, an inbound port that is for fiber. And then so the fiber comes in and it connects to uh, the switch and then all the different copper cables connect to the switch. And then the fiber goes back to the main demarcation and that goes back to the uh, ISP. More vocabulary. EF, entrance facility. That's the location where the incoming network internet or whatever connects to the school or corporate network. That's generally where the demarcation point will be located. That is a device that marks where a telecommunications service provider's network ends and the company's network begins. That is where the company's responsibility to their hardware starts. Main distribution frame, that's going to be a place where uh, the LANs or WANs are connected to the uh, demarcation point. A data room is a closed, it's just a room that holds the networking equipment. Usually it has a, a rack in it. In fact, well, that, it has to have a rack. And it also may have a server, and it also may have some other various equipment in there. Usually those are going to be racks in that room, and they're going to hold the various network equipment. A patch panel is simply a way to organize and cable manage your network cables that are coming in. Essentially what you have is Network plugs on the front with labels, and on the back you have a little short patch panel, or patch cable, pardon me, that runs out of the back of the patch panel and connects to a switch. And essentially the patch panel just allows you to have a nice, neat, orderly uh, 
cable layout. This is a, the, uh, a 3D representation of, of uh, structured wiring inside a building. You've got various workstations here. Horizontal wire, what it says horizontal wire, even though this may run vertically, horizontal means it just goes from one location to another. Whether that's vertical or horizontal doesn't really matter. What matters is it goes to a different location, and that is horizontal wiring. This would be a demarcation appliance. Basically, this yellow line that you have coming in is copper fiber optic line. Pardon me, not, fi not copper, fiber optic line. I'm sorry. You'll notice it's, uh, it's wound, it's wrapped, and you'll notice it's also loose. It's not pulled tight. And that's very important. You do not want to stretch fiber optic cable at all. You want it to keep it loose. You want to have a lot of slack in it. And then what you do with your slack is you coil it and tape it to the wall or coil it and use these little uh, uh, zip ties, basically, and connect it to the wall. But you want it to be nice and loose. You want there to be plenty of slack because if you pull this stuff tight, it will break. All right. So basically, you've got your connector here for the fiber coming in. And inside here, in this case, because you've got Cat5 or you've got copper coming out, then you're going to have a converter in here that converts from optical data to uh, copper data. And so inside this box, that's the demarcation point. In this case, the ISP's fiber optic comes into this box, and the company's copper comes out of the box. That's the point of demarcation between the ISP's network and the uh, company's network. This is a patch panel. Actually, it's a bank of patch panels. And so what you have here is all your uh, copper coming in from all around the building. Comes in big bundles like this and then splits out neatly. This was done by somebody that knows what they're doing for the most part. And so it goes into the ports on the patch panel. Notice they're all labeled. That's part of network documentation. You absolutely have to keep these accurately labeled. And if you could see the back of this, you would see a bunch of little short uh, network cables coming out of here and probably back here somewhere there will be a switch and each one of these ports on the patch panel is connected to a port on the switch so what this is basically is just a, a face that gives you a place to plug in network cables neatly uh, because the switch never never works out like that Voice over IP telephone equipment. Basically, what has uh, replaced phone lines? Voice over IP allows you to send voice transmission over the same kind of network that a computer would use. It uses the TCP IP protocols, and it allows you to send voice data just like you would send packet data. Um, the PBX is a, is a switch or a routing device for phones. Uh, gateway. Uh, that's also a switch for phones. And then the voice over IP endpoints are phones. They're the actual telephone headsets that you would talk on your desk. Intermediate distribution frame, these are the data rooms. And then the main distribution frame is the main data room, basically. That's how you can look at that. Work areas in all three buildings. The work area basically is where workstations, printers, and other network devices sit. The wall jacks are the places where the network cables plug into the wall. Okay, this is what, uh, if you're connecting a phone system, if you're going from uh, old analog phone to digital phone, or if you're going from digital phone to analog phone. So you've got the telephone company here, you got a voice gateway, you got a phone switch that goes to the various phones. Then you've got a voice over IP PBX. This allows you to connect an analog phone system to a digital phone system. Here you've got a uh, digital voice over IP connector, and you could connect the rest of your phone system here, and, and these would be this would be a digital phone system. On the other hand, you're going to connect a digital phone system to an old legacy voice or regular telephone system. You would start with your internet service provider, going through a regular data switch, going through a uh, digital voice gateway into a PBX, uh, an old style telephone PBX system, and then to the to the different phone 
uh, endpoints. And so there are two ways to route a phone system. And this is kind of the way you would lay that out. Uh, we're not going to go into detail at this point on that, but just know that you can connect digital and analog phone systems together. This is another network diagram. Uh, basically, it's the same one that we saw earlier. You got three buildings. Actually, this one's a different. This one has four buildings because you got building, 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 and then the main building as well. You're coming in from the ISP, and you're going to these backbones. Each one of the connections between the MDF and the IDF uh, is a backbone, and then usually that's going to be uh, fiber. Pardon me. And then once it hits the IDF, it'll get converted to copper and go to the different um, wall plugs. Racks, you should be familiar with racks. They come in two and four post varieties. I have seen, or pardon me, I've never seen a six post rack. I can't even imagine why you would need something that big. Um, unless you've got something ridiculously heavy that you had to put in it. Racks can be wall mounted or ceiling mounted, freestanding or bolted to the floor. Two post racks are generally going to be bolted to something, either the floor or the ceiling or both. Racks are measured in rack units or U's. If I say there's a 4U server and a 4U power supply and a 2U switch, that means I've taken up 10 U's of rack space. Uh, this is just the space between the holes going up and down the rack. So we'll look at this in a moment, but basically uh, you've got screw holes going up and down the racks, the, the poles on each side of the rack, and the number of screw holes that a a piece of equipment covers is how many U's tall it is. The whole rack is going to be 42 U's tall for the most part. That's industry standard. The width, all racks, and all rack equipment is going to be 19 inches wide. Uh, you don't want to make racks any wider. You don't want to make them any narrower because nothing will fit. You won't be able to mount your equipment into anything that's not uh, 19 inches wide. And then the depth. Basically, the depth depends on whether it's a four or a two pole rack. Uh, a two pole rack really doesn't have depth because it's just two poles and then the back is as far back as you can go. Now, the difference there, four pole racks generally will support weight a lot better. A two pole rack, particularly if you've got a very long object like a server, then you need to mount that in the middle of the rack, or not in the middle of the rack, you need to mount the rack in the middle of the uh, object because you don't want it sticking really far out the back of the rack because what happens is when you bolt it to the front, then the rack's mounting ears or the appliance, whatever it is, the server or router or whatever, it's mounting ears will bend. And so anything that's, that's really, really heavy, really wide, you want to put it on a shelf and mount that into the rack rather than trying to use the mounting ears and bolting it even with the front, which I'll show you what that looks like. All right. So you're looking at here at a two, basically these are a set of three, or four rather, two pole racks. These are going to be bolted to the floor. And they're probably going to have mounts, uh, either mounting them to this wall, it looks like they're bolted to this wall as well. A lot of times you'll see rods coming down and anchoring them to the ceiling. And so uh, there's a pole, there's a pole, and you'll see, if you could see that close, you'd see there are holes. Uh, spaced out about every inch along these poles going up and down. Those are the U's that we talked about. The difference between, or the space between these vertical holes, that's how many U's something is. So this uh, power supply this looks like, yeah, this is a, uh, this is a, uh, uh, a UPS, an interruptible power supply. Uh, it's probably either four or six U's tall. That means it takes one, two, three, four holes or six holes uh, it takes up that much space. Now, it may only use four screws, one on the top and one on the bottom of each ear, but it does cover that much space in the rack. These patch panels are usually two. Uh, switches are usually two. Servers can be four, can be even six. That's a two-pole rack because it just basically consists of two poles. On the other hand, a four-post rack has one, two, and in the back it has two more. And so basically it forms a little framework inside that you can mount things to. You can screw the fronts and the backs. They will have mounting uh, brackets available. And so what it does, it gives you a better support for your equipment. However, it also takes up a lot more room. There are pros and cons to using two 
post or open racks and enclosed four post racks. One of the main things about four post racks, especially if they have lockable doors, is it's just another layer of security. Uh, we talked about it a while ago, but it's very important that you keep your server rooms and anything else you can do, keep those things secured and locked. Uh, people are worried about hackers, and you see it on TV all the time. Someone's hacking into a network from a computer in another country. However, it's a lot easier to hack into a system if you're sitting in front of that computer actually working on the keyboard because you broke into the server room. Very important that you keep your racks and your data rooms locked because if you give people physical access, it's a lot easier to break into the network. Okay. Racks generate a lot of heat. And so, first of all, the rack room has to be very well insulated. It has to have air conditioning. A lot of racks, a lot of data rooms nowadays are insulated, or pardon me, not insulated, but air conditioned with ammonia systems. If you've ever worked in a packing house, if you've ever been around a meat packing plant, uh, they use ammonia systems rather than just regular coolant systems because they can generate a lot more cold air. Racks have to be refrigerated because they, the big collection of electrical equipment running generates a lot of heat. And also, the way the racks are set up within the data room uh, is important. This is the hot aisle, cold aisle rack layout. So, most computer components or network components or electrical components have a fan that blows out the back. And so what you want to do, starting with this first rack here, all the things in the rack, the fronts are on this side and the backs are blowing out the back here. That means that the cool air is coming in the front and the hot air from the component is being blown out the back. On this side, you've got the front of the component here in the back of the component here because this row is going to be a cool aisle. This is going to be where you're going to put your air conditioner vents. And so you've got conditioned air coming in the fronts of both of these sets of racks. With that, the hot air is blowing out away from the cool air side in both cases. Now, this third rack, the components are all facing back to back here. This is the back of these components. This is the back of these components. That way the hot air is concentrated into one aisle and now you have cool air coming from the air conditioner vents into this side. If you switch this one around so they're all facing the same way, then the hot air from this one, from the uh, exhaust of the electrical components, is going to be blowing into the intake for these electrical components and these guys will never get any cool air at all. They're just going to get hot air from the exhaust fans from these components. So it's very important when you're setting up your data center that you remember which side the hot is and which side the cool is. You need to have your air conditioner vents flowing into the aisles where the fronts of the components are and uh, your exhaust fans, which take hot air out, need to be uh, sucking the air from the uh, outside or from the backs of the various rows that have the back of the components facing them. I hope that made sense. Types of cables. We're going to build some patch cables in this class coming up pretty quickly. Uh, basically, it's Cat5 cable. It's short. It goes from a patch panel into a switch. And we talked about that a while ago. The patch panel is just a way to keep your cables organized. Every hole in a patch panel has a corresponding hole in a switch, and they're connected by a short patch cable. Horizontal cabling, we talked, that's just regular network cabling that connects different locations. Uh, it can connect an office to a switch. What it matters is that it's a different location from the place where it's at. Backbone cabling, a lot of times that's going to be fiber, and it's going to connect uh, the ISP to the MDF, that's the main data room, and then between the main data rooms and the, I, and the intermediate data rooms. Uh, you're going to have backbones, and they're generally going to be made of fiber, at least most modern companies. Most, I'm going to say most, many network problems are a result of poor cable. Uh, we'll look at some pictures maybe in class of what good cable management looks like and what bad cable management looks like. Uh, but you need to pay attention to, number one, the quality of the cable connectors. Don't buy the cheap stuff at Office Depot or Home Depot. Uh, order the nice stuff from a, a reputable cabling company. 
And also, do your cable management while you're running your cables. Don't wait to try to come in afterwards and rehook and disconnect things. Manage your cables while you're running them. No cable from a workstation to a wall jack should be more than 10 meters. In fact, it shouldn't be more than about 6 feet, but uh, surely not more than 10 meters. Same thing with from the data jack up through the ceiling, down through the walls, and into the data room. That should never be more than 90 meters. That's, that's way too far. In fact, uh, even at that, you're probably going to be looking at signal uh, degradation. Cat5 cable, and we'll talk about this a little bit later when we're talking about cables, has a very limited range in uh, distance that it will run. And if you exceed that distance, then you won't get enough signal at the end of it so that you'll have a network connection. Uh, same thing here. This is to the, this is a, a, an IDF. Basically, uh, this backbone is running back to the main room. This is a server rack, it's a two post rack. And you've got a switch here. The MDF is coming, the backbone, this is probably fiber coming into the switch. And then you've got all these patch panels. And I know it only shows one, but usually there's more than one. Coming out of the switch into the, pardon me, patch cables, coming out of the switch into the patch panel. And then these connections are going from one, uh, going from the patch panel in through the walls, through the ceilings, uh, this is horizontal cabling, even though it looks vertical. I'm sorry they did that, but this is to signify different locations. And then it comes out of the wall and goes into the computer. And that's basically how a uh, connection should be made. Cable management, we're gonna look at termination. That's uh, when we're building network cables. You never wanna leave more than an inch of exposed cable uh, between the end of the cable and the termination point and where you cut the where you cut the uh, insulation off the outside cable the outside uh, plastic bend radius that's how far you can bend either copper or fiber without breaking it or without damaging it with fiber I'm mean, pardon me with fiber it's not very tight you cannot bend fiber or you can't stretch it you have to basically just lay it and then uh, make sure you have plenty of slack with copper you can bend it, but you don't want to bend it very far because when you do, the little copper lines inside the Cat5 cable will break. We're going to use continuity testers. Not only that, we're going to use network testers. We're going to make sure that we don't break any cables, that we get our, our uh, clamps done correctly and we get our ends terminated correctly. Um, you want to use conduit when you're running, when you're running cables across the floor. You want to use floor covers. Uh, if they're exposed because you don't want people walking on them and tripping. Stay away from EMI, electromagnetic interference. That's basically fluorescent lights, microwave ovens, refrigerators, anything like that that can generate electromagnetic interference is going to degrade your uh, network connections if you run your cables too close. And then plenum cabling, basically if you're running uh, cabling through uh, above the ceiling, through the false ceiling tiles, or below a subfloor, you want to make sure that the cabling is rated for that sort of run. Uh, likewise, if you're running outside cable, you can buy uh, outside Cat5 cable or Cat5e or Cat6, and you need to make sure that your, your cabling is rated for the environment that you're running in. If things need to be grounded, make sure that they are. Also, you want to keep slack in your cable runs. Do not pull network and especially do not pull fiber optic cable tight. Use cable trays. These are little racks and little brackets that go on the side of racks that allow you to uh, keep your cable in nice, neat bundles. Patch panels, we talked about those. They're just basically uh, ways to organize your connections and connect your uh, cables to switches in a neat and orderly fashion. Standards and inventory. Every company should have some kind of standard operating procedure, and uh, it should have that make sure that all the, the network uh, maintenance is done the same way and all the repairs are done the same way. And then documentation, you definitely need to keep everything documented. Color coding, that's why we make uh, a network cable of different colors, is because you can use it to say, okay, well, all the 
all the marketing guys get purple cables and all the admin guys get red cables, etc. So using a color coding system can really help. You don't just want to see uh, bundles and bundles and bundles of blue cable. And you got to think, well, somewhere in there, there's a marketing cable that's got a problem and I've got to check it. And then as you do the document, or pardon me, as you work on the network, as you add things and take away things, update the documentation then. Don't wait. Huh. Data rooms get hot. We talked about that just a few minutes ago. They generate a lot of heat because basically uh, electricity running through any kind of, uh, of a conductor generates heat. It's not a perfect, it's not a perfectly 100% efficient system so it generates heat and when you have a lot of servers or a lot of switches you can generate a lot of heat most uh, professional data service uh, buildings are going to have uh, like i said a, an ammonia refrigeration system rather than just regular heating and air conditioning they produce a lot of heat and when they get too warm they stop working also humidity will affect them also airflow we talked about the cold aisle hot aisle uh, layout. You want to make sure that exhaust air is blowing out away from the components, away from the front of the components. And so you need to alternate uh, which way your components are facing. And then once again, security. Every IT or every data room should be locked. And you should limit the number of people that have keys because it's a lot easier to break into a computer when you're sitting at the keyboard. Okay, physical, uh, pardon me, uh, knowledge check. Which of the following causes physical layer failures? Which of these four things can actually cause a physical network uh, failure? And the answer is the EMI, electromagnetic interference. That's uh, microwave ovens, that's hair dryers, that's basically uh, anything that produces a, a electromagnetic interference. And... Uh, it's also not a bad idea if you're going to have, well, if you're going to have cabling running anywhere near one of those sources of EMI, you need to use shielded cable. Basically, uh, what it's got is the outside layer of plastic, and then inside that there's a layer of aluminum foil, and that shields the cable from EMI. Documentation, we've talked about that. It's just a graphical outline of your network. Uh, basically, you need to know the three reasons why it's important. And I'll, there are a lot of other reasons why it's important but you do need to know those three. Uh, it can be done on paper. It can be done with a program uh, like Vimeo, something, you know, there are a lot of uh, programs out there that you can use to draw a network and have icons and, and use lines to represent the cabling. It shows the physical layout, the logical topology. It shows IP addresses, uh, names of network devices like servers and also it shows the difference between where you know where the where the fiber starts and the copper begins or where the Wi-Fi is it going. Network mapping uh, we're going to use Nmap and basically it's easy it's a command line tool so you're going to need to be familiar with the command line and how to use it but uh, let me tell you right now and let me make this very clear this is important do not whatever you do Run Nmap over at the library, or over at the uh, you know inside the building, uh, or over at the cafeteria, or somewhere on over at the dorm. Don't run Nmap because what'll happen is the IT guys are going to think this is some kind of a packet sniffing network attack, and they're going to shut you off. You will not be able to log back in. They will deactivate your account, and then you're going to go get to explain to them what happened before they will turn your account back on. And uh, remember, uh, network non-connectivity is not an excuse for not getting your work done. So they will disable your account, and they will uh, basically uh, not be very, I don't know, they don't have much of a sense of humor when it comes to things like that. So do not run these network tools on the school network. When you, if you need to run them, number one, run them at home. If you're going to run them at home, unplug your ISP uh, cable from your router first, so you're basically just hitting your router and then whatever computers you have connected to that. Or come here a little early, I'll be here by 530, and I'll let you run them on the non-connected network that we have here. You'll notice you have 
blue network cables and gray network cables. The blue ones are connected to the internet. You do not want to run them connected like that. But if you want to run them on the gray cables, basically that is an internal network that doesn't have an out, doesn't have an out point, and so you don't have to worry about uh, offending anybody over at IT or or offending anybody at the internet service provider. So Nmap is a good tool. Just know when you're going to run it and what you're doing. Cisco Systems that is the manufacturer of a lot of the routers and switches that we use sets the standard for diagram symbols and basically what these uh, okay first of all that's a picture of Nmap and that's a picture of the results that you get when you run it as a command line it will diagram your network for you basically it will uh, give you a list of all the nodes on your network and uh, you can get IP addresses all kinds of things from there okay these symbols this little cloud for the internet this little brick wall for a firewall a router is a circle with arrows that point in all different directions to designate routing. A switch basically is a square with arrows that go in and out. And then these pictures here of the various network components, those are Cisco diagrams. There are some non-standard uh, icons that other companies use, but for the most part, we're going to go with Cisco diagramming. Network diagrams provide a broad snapshot of the physical and logical topology. That's very useful when you're planning on putting in new tools, new components, or new uh, cabling. A wiring schematic is specific to the cabling, and that's what you want to use. Uh, it shows the wires, basically every wire in the uh, in the building or in the uh, in the system. And then a rack diagram is just a drawing that shows specifically for a rack what components are there and how they're arranged. So that would be a network diagram. It's got various and sundry uh, pieces on it. You'll notice here's a router. You can tell because it's got uh, arrows pointing in multiple directions. They call it a gateway, but it's the same thing. If you look at a switch, generally I don't think there's one that they have in the right diagram, but it would have arrows on the top of it that show that data is coming in and out. Uh, this would be a rack diagram. These are the switches up here. Patch panels, if you could see the back of it, you'd see that for every one of these holes, there's a corresponding patch cable running to a, a, a port on the switch. The servers are down here. UPS is down here. The reason that you want to put the UPS at the bottom like that is because they're heavy, really heavy. So you put the heavy components at the bottom, lighter components like switches and patch panels at the top. That's a very important thing to remember as well. Operating procedures, SOP for companies, basically it makes sure that your maintenance and that your uh, network management is consistent. Uh, so you want to, uh, first thing you want to do in a new company is get the SOP manuals and read them. Inventory management, uh, system lifecycle, we're not going to go too deeply into. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with that. You can read through this part as well. Naming and labeling conventions will be set up by the SOP for your company. But there are some, these are just some things that you want to consider, particularly if you're the one that's making up the uh, SOP. That happens a lot too. When you go to a place and you're the first one that's ever been hired there, uh, you get to come up with all this stuff. So these are just some things to consider. Uh, labeling, like I said, this is, these are patch panels. These are the cables coming in. It is important to keep things labeled and also to label the cables themselves. You can either use these little stick-on labels or you can use these tapes. Either way, what it does is it allows you to make sure that the right cable is connected to the right port. Uh, these labels are on a Cisco router. You can stick these little stick-on labels and it will give you a, a, a record of what's supposed to go in what slot. Business documents, I'll just let you read these definitions. Same thing here. And then finally, what network diagram shows logical topology? And the correct answer is a network map. Basically, it's a, it's a way of uh, discovering and identifying the devices. The, uh, not necessarily their physical layout, but where they are uh, in relation to the server. All right, we're not going to look at change management. I'll let you read that. Also, hardware and software changes. I'll let you read that. Ugh. And finally, the summary. Remember, we talked about the three, uh, the three goals for this module. Well, here they are again. Describe the roles of various network cabling equipment in commercial buildings. 
maintain the documentation and then manage changes. Those three things you should have gotten from hopefully from this uh, brief overview and from reading the chapter. Remember, that's where you want to get your information from. Read the chapter. All right. Hope you guys have had a good uh, day. And I hope that so far you're having success in this class. If not, please, please, please come talk to me. If you're having difficulty understanding something, if uh, you miss something because you're absent, whatever, please come and talk to me. Also, remember, class uh, on Thursday nights is not optional. That is a mandatory thing. If you're not there, uh, if you're not participating, then you're going to be counted absent, so you have to be there. Also, the working canvas, that is not voluntary or not optional as well. If you, uh, if you come to class but you're not doing the work in Canvas, you can still be outed for um, non-participation and they don't do refunds here. So it's very important that you stay caught up. Stay caught up in Canvas. Stay caught up uh, with the class and the lab work. And uh, like I said, if you have any questions at all, please contact me and let me help you. All right. Have a good night.